Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carrie Abrams, Dean of Duke Law School, and it is my privilege today to welcome you to the 2023 Raphael Lemkin Rule of Law Guardian Program, honoring Professor Harold Honju Ko, the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale University. Professor Ko is widely regarded as one of the country's leading experts in public and private international law, national security law, and human rights. For most of his career, through scholarship and public service, Professor Ko has championed the idea that law and diplomacy are our best weapons for ending human rights abuses and holding aggressors to account. He has masterfully deployed international law and processes to secure justice and advance the rule of law here in the United States and around the globe. It is for this work and for his unyielding faith in and commitment to the rule of law that we are pleased to honor Professor Coe today. Professor Coe was born in Boston to immigrant parents who happened to share the distinction of being the first Asian Americans to teach at Yale. He followed in their scholarly footprints, earning degrees from Harvard College, Oxford University, and Harvard Law School before embarking on a distinguished career that has included distinguished positions in academia, public service, and private practice. After law school, Professor Coe clerked for Justice Harry A. Blackman of the US Supreme Court and Judge Malcolm Richard Wilkie of the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. He then worked in private practice and was an attorney advisor in the US Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. He began teaching at Yale Law in 1985 and later became the 15th Dean of Yale Law School. Before his deanship, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. After his deanship, he was appointed and confirmed as the US Department of State's 22nd Legal Advisor. Professor Coe has written or co-written nine books, published more than 200 articles, and presented scores of arguments in US courts and international tribunals. He has received numerous awards and degrees, is a fellow of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an honorary fellow of Magdalen College of Oxford, and a member of the Council of the American Law Institute. More recently, Professor Koh has served on the team of lawyers representing Ukraine in a suit filed against Russia in the International Court of Justice, or the ICJ. In fact, he was in The Hague just two weeks ago to present arguments on behalf of Ukraine before the ICJ, which I hope that we will get to hear about more today. I'm also pleased to introduce Judge Paul W. Grimm, who will lead our program today. Judge Grimm is the David F. Levy Professor of the Practice of Law and Director of the Bolch Judicial Institute here at Duke Law School. He came to Duke just at the beginning of this year, almost a, uh, like three quarters of a year ago now. <laughs> Um, after retiring from 25 years of judicial service as a first a magistrate judge, then a chief magistrate judge, and then a district judge in the US District Court for the District of Maryland. An elected member of the American Law Institute, Judge Grimm has served on the advisory committee for the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and as chair of the Discovery Subcommittee. He also served both on active duty and in the Army Reserve as a Judge Advocate General Corps officer and retired in the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. As director of the Bolts Judicial Institute, Judge Grimm now directs a range of programs and initiatives that advance the rule of law, protect judicial independence, and improve court administration here in the United States and around the world. He also directs our Master of Judicial Studies degree program from which he graduated in 2016. Before we proceed, I want to note that we are recording the program and will make the recording available later this week on the Duke Law and Bolch websites and YouTube channels. And now I will turn things over to Judge Grimm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Abrams, for that really wonderful introduction. And welcome all of you, and Professor Coe especially, welcome to you. Um, every year, uh, the Bolt Judicial Institute uh, awards the Lemkin Rule of Law Guardian Medal to a remarkable individual uh, who has taken steps to protect and advance the rule of law. Examples include lawyers who fight for justice for their clients, judges who follow the law even when doing so is unpopular, 
uh, men and women who stand up for due process and make our justice system work to ensure that all people are treated with fairness and dignity. These are the guardians of the rule of law. They make it so that our democracy lives up to its purpose and that human rights are protected. The Lemkin Rule of Law Guardian Medal is named for Raphael Lemkin, one of the leading scholars of the 20th century in human rights. Raphael Lemkin was a Polish lawyer and scholar who devoted his entire professional life to the study of war crimes and advocated for the use of the criminal law to defend peace. That was a notion that was very important to him. Defend peace through international law uh, and to prosecute crimes against humanity. He is credited with coining the word genocide uh, from the Greek word genos, meaning tribe or group, uh, and the Latin word side for kill. Um, and uh, he is largely credited uh, for using his expertise in international law, which led in 1948 uh, to the passage of the Gen Genocide Convention at the United Nations, which obligated member states to bring crimes of genocide to trial. Raphael Lemkin came to the United States during World War II as a refugee. He narrowly escaped capture by the Germans uh, and came to uh, North Carolina here at Duke because of a prior relationship he had with a Duke law professor, Malcolm McDermott. And he served on the faculty at Duke Law School from April 1941 until June of 1942. Uh, our first recipient of this medal uh, was Benjamin B. Ferenz, who in 2020 uh, received the award for his work uh, as uh, one of the Nuremberg war crimes prosecutors. At the time he received it, he was 99 years old and one of the last remaining prosecutors from that, uh, that effort after World War II. Um, our recipient last year, uh, thankfully, much younger and in great health, is our own <laughs> beloved uh, Professor James E. Coleman, uh, who received it for his remarkable work, uh, nationally recognized leadership in pursuing justice for those who are wrongfully convicted and advocacy for death penalty reform. As you can see from the introduction uh, that Dean Abrams gave, there is no more fitting person to receive it this year than Professor Coe, who has dedicated his entire professional career to supporting the rule of law. Um, and so at this time, uh, before we go into the question and answer period, uh, let me um, take this opportunity to give to you uh, the Raphael Lemkin Guardian of the Rule of Law Award, assuming I can get it open. And there you are. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it like at Wimbledon. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> well, let's jump right in. Um, Professor Coe, you have uh, credited your parents uh, with being the primary inspiration for your life's work. Uh, can you just sort of give us a sense of what the influence of your parents met on your uh, decision to pursue a career in law? Uh, yeah, well, um, so my late father, Kwang Lung Ko, uh, was born on a small island off the coast of South Korea called uh, Cheju Island. Um, he was the first student from the island ever to study law in Seoul. And then he was the first student from Seoul ever to study law in America, and he went to Harvard Law School. Uh, my mother was from a very um, prominent family in Seoul. Uh, they never would have married or met in Korea because they were from such different social classes. Um, but my mother uh, won a scholarship to Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and she came here, and she met my dad, and they had um, six children. I'm the fourth. Uh, when you're the fourth, you know, you get left at gas stations. And <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody much cares uh, what you're up to as long as you turn up at night. And, uh, but uh, it, both of them had very remarkable experiences. My, my mother, only recently, she's now 92 and lives near me in New Haven, Connecticut, 
told me that um, her family had a, a home, a summer home in North Korea. And she was there when the country was divided uh -huh. and was there for five months under Russian rule with her uh, uh, two teenage brothers and was told that uh, Russian soldiers would rape or kill any uh, Korean girl who was around. So she cut off all her hair and um, they were told that there was one road where if you went down the road you could uh, uh, pretend like you were going to an adjacent town near the border but in fact sneak across and so they somehow got a message to her father to send a car and they walked by all these Russian guards um, and they got to the border and there was no car there and um, uh, they didn't know what to do. She was 16 years old. Uh, she slept by the side of the road <coughs> and they woke up the next morning and uh, a car arrived and took her to Seoul and the next day or soon after she went to America. And um, so uh, these are very fortuitous events. And I think I want to stress that for every student here. You know, you're, you're here and you, you, know, you sort of are born into a certain life. And then, then you start to realize that there are these fortuities that uh, have given you a chance to be where you are. Uh, and how, how do you react to this? Um, you know, when I was a student in law school, I was trying to decide, should I go to Sullivan and Cromwell or Covington and Burling for, <laughs> for both fine firms for, for my big law summer job. And I agonized about that. By the way, I had never heard of either firm six months earlier, but in the law school environment, you know, this is a big deal. <laughs> so finally I decide and I tell my mother I'm going to uh, Covington and Burling. And my mother goes, oh. And then she goes, you know, this uh, Sullivan and Burling, uh, <laughs> uh, she said, uh, do they need you the most? And I said, what? She said, do they need you the most? I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, you know, all we could do is give you your education. And you have the best education that money can buy. And she said, I think you're the most privileged person on earth. Why aren't you serving the least privileged? That was her reaction. And I thought about that for a long time. And I thought, well, she, maybe she's right. So. Um, my father uh, uh, gave me two tremendously powerful lessons, or ma many, many lessons, but um, he was uh, at Harvard, uh, he was uh, probably the greatest Korean student of his generation, a uh, legendary student. And when he was uh, doing his doctorate at Harvard Law School, um, the government of Korea fell, Sung Man Ri, and um, the uh, uh, a military, uh, so there was an election, and the uh, then uh, ambassador from Korea to Washington decided to run for prime minister to be set up the first democratic government of Korea, and asked my father to go back and campaign, and they did, and they were elected in the first democratic government in the history of Korea, um, and uh, there was this incredible excitement. This was in 19. 59, just before the Kennedy administration. But my father was very worried about stability, he wanted to stay in America, so we moved to Washington. He became uh, the ambassador in Washington. Um, and a couple things happened. You know, first of all, this was not long after Brown versus the board, but we lived in Tacoma Park, uh, Maryland. The, the very first day I was there, um, we went out to play recess and all the black kids were on one team and all the white kids were on another team. And they didn't know where I was supposed to go. I, they never had an Asian there before. <laughs> and uh, I thought, why are, they, why are they doing this? This is, this is the United States of America. I, I was just in shock. Um, secondly, um, uh, while my father was there, he, he was basically um, the point of contact for Korea with the National Security Council. And uh, the head of whom was McGeorge Bundy, and the, the deputy head was uh, Walt Rostow, famous um, economics professor at Texas. And um, 
One day he was called and told there's going to be a military coup d'etat in Korea. And uh, my father was so upset, he flew directly to uh, Korea. And the prime minister, his friend, told him, um, uh, don't worry, uh, General Park, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, will prevent this from happening. He, of course, then did the coup d'etat a couple <laughs> days later yes. and was the dictator of Korea for a good 20 years. And my father was exiled and um, uh, unemployed. And he flew back to Washington and convened a meeting at the embassy where he said to all of the embassy staff, uh, I would like you to sign this, uh, this petition that none of us will serve the military government. We will only work for a democracy. And everybody signed. And uh, within a year, every single person, except my father, broke that promise. And they all went to serve the military government. Uh, a couple of days after that, he was summoned to the White House by Walt Rostow. And Walt Rostow said to him, um, I want to tell you that um, they're trying to execute your friend, the prime minister, who is in house arrest. But I want to assure you that he will not be harmed. And my father was just blown away, like uh, American power, that uh, across the oceans, this guy sitting in this White House in Washington can say, you will, he will not be harmed. And then sort of at the end, he goes to my father, by the way, what are you, what are you up to? And uh, my father said, well, I'm, I'm exiled, and I'm <laughs> un unemployed, and I have uh, six children. And he said, uh, don't you teach law? And my father said, uh, yes. And he said, you know, my, um, my brother, Gene Rostow, is dean of Yale Law School. He goes, let me call him. So he literally picked up the phone like this, and he goes, rrr, Gene, rrr, hung up the phone. And my father said, the call was so short that there was no way anything important could have happened. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, Rasta, the absent-minded professor, starts assembling things on his desk. And my father said, well, thank you for making the call. I'm sorry it didn't work out. And uh, Rasta said, uh, oh, no, can, can you get here in a week? He said, can you get here in a week? <laughs> so a week later, we, each of us could take one bag. We got on a train. We went to New Haven. And uh, you know, 40 years later, I was dean of Yale Law School. That's an American story. You don't hear that anywhere else in the world. So, uh, and then finally, and this goes to the rule of law point, um, early in my life, as many students do of, of uh, multiple heritages, uh, I went back to Korea. Um, this was uh, during Watergate, and um, suddenly, there was an assassination attempt on the wife, uh, on, on, Kim, on Pak chung Ki, the very guy who had done this coup. And his wife was killed in the gunfire. And they suddenly sealed the city, closed all the airports, and there were tanks in the streets, and they issued this uh, shoot on sight uh, curfew. So if you were out, I was a summer school student, if you were out after 11 o'clock, you could be shot on sight. And you know, so we were all huddled in our dormitory, and um, that day, Nixon resigned, and Gerald Ford became the president. And I called my father, and I said, I'm not sure when I'm going to get out of here. And I said, uh, but I'm just amazed. Uh, you know, this, Korea has never had a peaceful transition of government. And um, the United States, the most powerful country in the world, just changed its president, and there was no army, and there was no guns, and there was no curfew, no martial law. And my father said, that's the difference. He said, in Korea, if you control the troops, they call you president. But in the United States, if you're the president, the troops obey you. That's the difference between the rule of law and the rule of individuals. And he said, that's why we have to live here. I can imagine the impact that that must have had on you in Korea when he was saying that, knowing what had happened to him and the uncertainty that he had 
faced when he went to the White House not knowing what was going to happen in that meeting and having stood up to say that he would not serve except a democratically elected government um, and standing by that principles and knowing that that very well could mean that he had nothing to do to support his family. He had to then look for it with six children and, and then uh, that opportunity occurred, and that is something I think is a is a lesson today. When we sometimes, you know, as as citizens can do, question our country, the reminder of these uh, examples, these shining examples of the best of what we can be. Did these experiences shape your interest in pursuing international law as opposed to doing something else in the in the public service? <laughs> well. Um Partly because of my father's traumatic experience, he, he said to me, study physics. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I did, you know, and uh, I went to a high school that was uh, not good at physics. Uh, so I did better than, than I should have. And then I got to Harvard and all these kids who did physics were just uh, light years ahead of me. It was a little, it was shocking and embarrassing. And, uh, so I was doing physics, and um, especially when you're Asian, people think you know what you're talking about if, if you don't speak up. So you have to just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but as it dragged on, and I was getting more and more um, uh, confused, uh, I started thinking, why am I doing this? You know, I don't particularly like it. And then, um, this is very important for the students, I thought, um, you know, what is it that's distinctive about me? I, I was born in America of Korean parents, so I'm between two cultures. So why don't I do something where I'm sort of a bridge between these two cultures? And maybe I should be a diplomat, or maybe I should be a professor, or maybe I should be an international lawyer. But certainly I shouldn't just be going into the basement into a lab all night um, doing these experiments, which I didn't really understand. Um, and as I was having these thoughts, I was uh, one day walking to the lab for another four hours in the basement, and this very tall, blonde surfer guy in my dorm went by the other direction, and he said, uh, I'm going to Asian politics. And I thought, you're going to Asian politics? <laughs> so I said, I'll go with you. And then suddenly, everything made sense, and I switched my major that day. And... Um, that tells you, by the way, if, if it doesn't feel right, you should just uh, follow your heart because uh, that's going to be the surest sign that um, uh, you should be on a different track. Well, I think we can all be very grateful for physics, physics um, sending you in the direction that you needed to because you did become a law professor, professor uh, an, an ambassador, ambassador, and uh, also an international scholar. So all of those things we can thank. Uh, string theory or whatever it was that chased you out of the lab. Uh, uh, there's one other thing I, I wanted to mention, which is, you know, in the early 50s, uh, there was a big snowstorm in Boston. And my brothers and I, the three of us, were very close in age. We all got a fever. And um, when it was over, um, <coughs> I couldn't walk. And so uh, they took us to the hospital and they said, you have polio. And... Uh, it was the, one of the last cases of polio. And so for the next 10 years, I had a whole series of operations and treatments and things like this. And at the beginning, I was just filled with self-pity, like, how could this have happened to me? But it was actually the best experience I ever had because everybody else was in such worse condition. Um, uh, but it taught me something, which is, you know, life... Um, reaches out and touches certain people and they are, for whatever reason, you know, born in the wrong country or born to a group of people who are subjected to various kinds of oppressions or they, they suffer from illnesses or differences and that this just makes a dramatic difference in their life, which has absolutely nothing to do with their merit. And, um, you know, it really shouldn't be. You know, um, my brothers and I all got the exact same fever, they just had more immunities. And so part of my conviction based on that is, you know, there have to be people who focus on equalizing 
these differences and making sure that everybody is treated the same. You know, as Dr. King said, you know, judge by the content of their character. And when you, when you pursued that and then went on to law school, did you uh, take classes in law school that furthered your interest in international law? No. <laughs> I had a terrible experience in law school. Um, I went to uh, another law school, not Yale Law School. Um, by the way, uh, you know, I mean, law school is a better experience now for students because uh, the, the administration's got around to the idea that maybe the students should enjoy what they're doing. Um, the, back then, it was a, just a real boot camp. And um, I actually went with the thought I might be a professor someday. And within a couple months, uh, and, and to do international law, that was all beaten out of me. Um, but then I was lucky to get these uh, clerkships. And when I went to Washington, uh, Judge Wilkie, my first judge, so I clerked for two judges. I'm a Democrat. They're, they were both Republicans. Uh, judge Wilkie, uh, who is a Republican from Texas, said to me, I'll never ask you two questions. One is, what is your religion? And the second is, who did you vote for? Um, but he, he had a clerk who did criminal law cases, and you know, he was very pro-prosecutor. He had somebody who did uh, administrative law cases, big rate makers. And then he said, and I need a clerk who does international law. So not liking the other two, <laughs> I said, OK, I'll do the international law cases. And the next year for Justice Blackman, uh, same thing. He had one clerk who did tax cases, one clerk who did criminal law cases, and one clerk who did inter international law. And I did it. And, and both times I thought, wow. This, this is an incredible field. And more than that, um, this is another one for you students. The first time I, you know, so here I am having taken almost no international law. And uh, I suddenly realized, well, I really should be doing international law. And I told my father, who had told me to study physics, this is what I'm doing. And he said, uh, just like your father. He was, he was very pleased. He, he had hoped that this would happen, I think. Um, but I had to then sort of self-educate. And um, I ended up going to all these panels of the American Society of International Law and all these other things. And the first panel I went to, there are these four old guys who had been on every single panel for the previous 50 years. They're just uh, pontificating. And I thought, wow, I'll, I'll never know what these guys know. Like I was like, their head start is too great. But then I started working on some of this stuff. And then I went to a panel about the case I was working on, the Nicaragua US case at the International Court of Justice. And these same four guys were there pontificating away. And I realized, they don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> They're not there. You know? And um, you know, that's one thing about uh, international law. It moves so fast. If you just keep your eye on the, on the ball, um, you'll You'll just, just pay attention. That's all you have to do. And um, um, the world will come to you. So since then, I paid attention. And um, that's, that's all I've done. Did the experience of working on international law cases during your judicial clerkships uh, allow you to sort of get into the, the details of the cases that raise international law issues to be resolved uh, in a way that helped you to understand when you were going to the programs and listening to the, the uh, graybeards pontificate that the details, the, the facts that were specific to that, those issues in those people in those countries um, gave you the confidence where this is something that you could do because you could dig into those facts and, and you wouldn't just have to walk over there and express opinions in front of panels for the rest of your career? Uh, or did it just sort of whet your appetite to sort of point you in that direction and you develop that insight later on? Well, I started to realize how stunningly insular American lawyers are. They, they just focus on, you know, what North Carolina law or, or uh, U.S. law. You know, we're, we're part of 196 countries, and the, the international environment, you know, we're living in a completely global environment, and everything that's happening, um, you know, the, uh, the Research Triangle is an international center of knowledge. And so how can you just examine this from 
a, a local perspective or a national perspective. You, you have to focus on it from an international perspective. Um, Justice Blackman <laughs> was particularly good boss in several respects. First, he worked like there was no tomorrow. I never saw anybody work as hard. And his view was, you know, there's no excuse for, for, for not being prepared. But secondly, he always looked at the people who were being affected by the cases. You know, he would ask me, where are the children now? Or uh, the people who are making this argument, what's going to happen to them if we rule against them? Uh, but third and most important, he would say, what have other countries done? You know, I mean, I, I just want to say uh, our Supreme Court and its open rejection of foreign precedents is just lying to you. Twelve of the justices, twelve of them have all cited in the, have all cited to foreign precedents, including, by the way, uh, uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Alito in oral argument in suggesting that uh, Dobbs should overrule Roe. Well, what did other countries do? These same people in the confirmation hearing said, we won't look at foreign law. I want you to think for a second about how ludicrous that is. First of all, when we were a new country, all we did was right. look to foreign Absolutely. law. Absolutely. Now, there. John Marshall has more cases under international and foreign law than he did under US federal law, because there wasn't any US federal right. law. So guess what? If you're an originalist, you're a globalist. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, when he uh, was nominated, he was my student, he said, I believe in the American rule of law. Well, Brett, you know, there's a global rule of law of which the American law is a part. And, and let me make this point. We, we do not borrow from other countries. This, by the way, is something that Steve Breyer appropriately rejects. Um, this is just absurd. Like, uh, that'd be like my going to a, a ta kimchi taco truck, and they have, you want some kimchi on your taco? No, no, we can't borrow kimchi and put it in a taco. That's, that's not what we do. We look only at American uh, foods, like Frankfurter, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, you know, uh, borrowing is as American as der Frankfurter and Apfelkuchen at a baseball park, you know? We borrow, that's what we do. And, you know, I go to bar mitzvahs and they're dancing to Gangnam style. <laughs> yeah. And then I listen to our justices say, we're not going to look at foreign precedent. I mean, this is just, and, and by the way, even the liberal justices are now forced to recite this, like in a hostage video, to, <laughs> to get confirmed. And, um, you know, if we're not the first country to have done it, I mean, nobody's telling you that you're bound by these foreign precedents, but you don't look. I mean, you look at a Law Review article written by a student note, you don't look. I mean, this, this is just the most ridiculous. And then, of course, as, as I've just pointed out, they do look when it helps their case. So I would just say this, this is, has to be, um, um, well, just over time, uh, you know, people will just, uh, you know, um, realize how ridiculous this is. We, you know, we can't live in a hermetically sealed environment. You know, you guys are, um, you know, every day, um, uh, you know, you're, you're reading stuff from around the world on the web. You know, it's easier for you to call China than it is to call your mother, <laughs> unless your mother lives in China. So... <laughs> Well, I, I, do you think this is just a sort of a moment in our legal history that, that, that we can uh, have hope that, that when these young, bright lawyers are out there making the decisions and, and uh, participating in the profession and in the government that will change? Or is this just something where on the surface we deny that we do it, but then we do it, especially when it helps us, but um, over time, perhaps even when we don't have an answer ready made here, but you see that others have done that and gotten there before you and have good advice to give? You think this is just sort of an artifact of where we are right now in our country? Well, when I was Assistant Secretary for Human Rights in the Clinton administration, I went to 95 countries in three years. And I mean, this will be obvious. You know, every country is better than its government. The people are better than their government. And so you just have to rely on the people and not the government. I mean, look, look at the pathetic situation we're in. 
pathetic. You know, um, we got a huge conflict in Ukraine, which has gigantic implications for the future of global security. Uh, Israel has just been attacked. Uh, and, and, you know, the response is going to be brutal and, uh, you know, potentially uh, itself very troubling under international law. And we don't have a Speaker of the House who is a constitutionally prescribed position. And, um, you know, uh, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, whatever it was, two weeks ago, they say, hooray, we've kept the government open for another 45 days. <laughs> and so let's get rid of the speaker so that when we finally do have a speaker, we only have 30 days to do this. <laughs> In which, by the way, we're going to have to decide whether to give aid to Ukraine and to Israel at the same time. I mean, this is a completely dysfunctional system. We, we have the best country in the world with the worst government and most dysfunctional government. And the solution to this is a group of, uh, of uh, new people who say, uh, we're just not going to do it this way. I mean, this is deeply pathetic and uh, not worthy of this great country. And um, we're going to do, be do it better, you know. Because, by the way, the same gr country has not been able to launch a solution to global public health, climate change, and any number of other things. So I want to transition just a bit uh, and talk about your um, work in public service in the government, Office of Legal Counsel, and then later in the State Department, uh, with the, and you worked with both the uh, Clinton and Obama administrations. Um, lots of students here are going to face that same um, uh, choice in their career. Uh, they may be thinking, I want to do private practice, um, but they may be thinking that they want to do public service. Um, can you... Uh, offer any thoughts uh, to uh, our uh, uh, students here about um, what they should keep in mind as they try to make that important decision as to go into where perhaps the, the most uh, lucrative career is versus doing public service and how those two can exist in a career over time and your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a baseball fan, Boston Red Sox. Um, that has its own uh, punishments. but. Um, there's a story that's told about Mickey Mantle, who is a famous uh, a great player, but also a, a great drunkard. And um, <laughs> one day he got hurt, and so he wasn't supposed to play the next day, and he went out and got completely smashed. And so he comes in, and the, the next day it goes to the ninth inning, and suddenly the game is tied, and the, and the, and the manager calls him uh, to pinch hit. And he comes, staggers to the plate, massively hung over, and he swings with all his might and misses the first pitch, swings with all his might, misses the second pitch, and then on the third pitch, he has this f phenomenal home run, and they win the game. And according to his teammates, Mantle looks out over the crowd and goes, those people don't know how hard that really was. <laughs> uh, that's what it's like being in the government, you know? You sit, here, you sit outside, and you think it's being done by machines, and... Um, you're inside and you realize these are human beings trying to do the best that human beings can do. And the question is, are you going to help them do better? And, um, you know, because of my polio, I never was going to be in the military. And um, I thought, well, uh, maybe this country saved my family, so I should give something back. And um, then I found, actually, it's, it's just the most interesting um, and exciting thing. And, and I want to tell you something, which is the, the difference between reality and political posturing. Um, when I was a legal advisor at the State Department, one day um, somebody comes and says, your wife is on the phone. My, my wife never calls me at work. And she says, our neighbor has just called. Her daughter has been captured, and she's in Libya. Oh. She's a journalist. Mm. Uh, believe possibly dead. Can you get her out, or can you find out where she is? So we formed a task force and um, worked on this for six weeks. And then finally, we got a break in the case where uh, we got a report that someone who matching her description might be alive. And we were having daily meetings of this group that was doing nothing but tracking people in Libya. Uh, and then uh, we suddenly learned that the government was going to shut down. And as a legal advisor, I had to go and read to them, like this, this piece of paper, uh, if, if on Friday 
at midnight, you know, uh, the government shuts down, it will be a criminal offense for you to work on this matter anymore and to use your government property or government cell phone or your government emails. And they just said, let them arrest us. We're doing real work here. We're trying to save somebody. Who are these people? Who are these people? You know, that let them come and arrest us. This is ridiculous, you know? Stop this. But they said, we're not gonna stop because we're almost got her out. And sure enough, the very last second, they didn't close the government just like now. Um, endless posturing as, as now. And she was released and she came home and I, I saw her at Christmas. And um, so that's the difference between real work and uh, this kind of stuff that you watch on TV. And I encourage you to be part of the real work because there's a lot of it. Uh, I want to ask about your role as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor during the late 1990s. Can you share with us some of the challenges uh, to human rights and the rule of law that you were focusing on at that time and whether there's the same kind of issues that we're dealing with now or, is there, or were there issues there that were unique to things that were going on specifically then? Well, it was a very exciting moment. It was the Clinton administration. I was uh, Madeleine Albright's uh, human rights um, assistant secretary. And we, what we experienced was what we were calling the globalization of freedom in that in the early 90s, um, you know, the Soviet Union broke apart and all these independent states and then South Africa, uh, you know, went, went um, democratic and then throughout Latin America. So, so more in the fall of the Berlin Wall, more people, uh, human beings, uh, started to live under democracy than ever before. And the question became, how can these democracies work together to sort of support common values. It, it was a Kantian moment, you know, Immanuel Kant's uh, theory of perpetual peace. Democracies working together around common values uh, to support human rights and the rule of law. Uh, but there are constant challenges. You know, Kosovo yes. happened while I was there. Uh, the um, violence in Sierra Leone, the creation of international criminal tribunals. but. The most moving uh, thing to me was at the very end, uh, we went to North Korea. Um, I was in North Korea for five days with, with Albright. And, uh, you know, um, we land there and um, there are no lights and uh, uh, there were no cars, there's no gasoline. And uh, in the dark, we proceed to this uh, guest house and then we met with uh, Kim Il Sung, um, uh, uh, Kim Jong, uh, Kim Jong Il, his son, um, who's a total, uh, you know, uh, he, he was not crazy. He was very, very smart, but nobody challenged him at all. And his son, of course, is now uh, Kim Jong Un. Um, and then when we left, I, I just, and all the Koreans, North Koreans, were totally dispirited. Um, you know, like Koreans are very energetic, uh, cheerful people, I, I have to say. <laughs> they were just, you know, moping around like, um, like you read in 1984, you know, just deeply depressed. And we took off, took out, off out of Pyongyang, and it's only 18 miles to Seoul. And as we approached Seoul, suddenly the, the sky just lit up with lights. And it just occurred to me, you know, these are the same people. It's the same culture. The only difference is that these guys live under a dictatorship. These people live under a democracy. And that's the difference between a world of light and a world of uh, darkness. I should just add, Paul, if you let me, that when we landed in Seoul, we went to see um, Kim Dae-jung, who is the president of Korea, the Nobel Prize winner, former political prisoner. And, Albright and I walked in, and they were just about to begin. And uh, uh, Kim Dae-jung said, before we begin, I just want to say, the son of Kwang Lim Ko is here. And <coughs> he was our hero in terms of uh, democracy. And what it means to us that his son is here as the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, I can't tell you. 
And, uh, you know, my dad had been dead for, you know, 10 years. And I thought, you're right, dad, you won. You know, so this tells you something. You think that this episode is over. Uh, a particular episode is closed. I thought when my dad passed away, you know, he had faced this uh, disappointment in his life. But in fact, you know, by 10 years later, he was vindicated. What he, what he had done was right. It was widely recognized in Korea that he was the person who was on the right side. So remember that. Life is long, and uh, the, the, the end points of episodes come at different times than you think. It must have been remarkably gratifying to have that um, affirmation of what your father had done um, at a time when you probably thought that that might never come, and there it was when you weren't expecting it. That must have been a, a really remarkable moment. Well, there's another thing, too, is, is all of his friends who didn't sign the, um, who, who broke their vow, uh, I said to him, do you feel bad? One of these guys became the prime minister, and I said, do you feel bad that, um, you know, you're a teacher at a, a university in the United States, and these this guys who is junior to you as prime minister. And he said, um, there will always be people in these jobs. There's always someone who will say what they want you to say. And he goes, so what? You know, you're assistant secretary of balloons because you're willing to say whatever they tell you to say about balloons. He goes, that's not what counts. It's whether you're saying something that's the truth. So just stick by your principles. That's, that's what he said. So anyway, I took that as a, as a, um, you know, a lesson of life. Well, I think that that's um, a lesson in life that all of us could learn, is to stick by your principles. And um, uh, do we have time for any questions? Uh, do we have some? I, I can just add this. There are two things. Always, you're only as good as your principles, P-L-E-S. And you're only as good as your principles, P-A-L-S. You're only as good as the people you represent. You know, I went, when I was in the Office of Legal Counsel, I was working for Ted Olson, who was a very outstanding lawyer. And then he was replaced by someone who, let me say, was not as good. And I wrote this great memo. He was supposed to present it. And then we went to the meeting, and he just um, embarrassed himself. Like, he, he didn't understand the issues at all. And I thought, I I'm only as good as he is. You know, you're only as good as your boss. So pick your boss carefully. You know, like if you work for Donald Trump, you're as good as Donald Trump. Don't kid yourself. So you got to work for people who will surprise you with their ability and imagination. Picking your mentors is an incredibly important lesson of life. Do we have a question? Do we have time for maybe a question or two? Anyone? Do you have a question, sir? Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for your work. I wanted to ask a bit about Ukraine. Um, I think, like many of us here, I'm outraged at what I've seen take place in that country. And I also wonder what power the International Criminal Court has to influence reality on the ground in that situation. Uh, well, so let me go back to a bigger point. A lot of people said to me, uh, I don't know if you saw the movie Apollo 13, you know, the, 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 the uh, spaceship gets into trouble and uh, they're in mission control or whatever. And the, and the guy says, um, tell the president this is a big disaster. And the guy running it says, tell him this is our finest hour. You know, I think a lot of people thought, okay, so the Russians invade Ukraine. This is the end of international law in the post-war period. My view has been one of our finest hours. You know, look, look at um, the way these institutions have responded. You know, if someone gets cancer, you don't blame them for getting cancer. The test of the system is how well it can respond and whether it can save the patient. And, um, you know, the grand strategy of Ukraine has been very simple, five parts. Um, information is good for Ukraine because the Russians are committing international violations. Isolation of uh, Russians and particularly Putin and the uh, oligarchs, then illegality, declare everything they do illegal to enhance their isolation. That, that keeps the Chinese and the Indians out of it. Then diplomacy and fifth, accountability. And that's the piece you're talking about. You know, so we have a sitting head of state 
who's been charged with uh, child stealing, you know? Now, if you don't think that this has restricted uh, Putin, you know, Putin was supposed to go to the BRICS summit in South Africa. The BRICS are, you know, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. He didn't go because he thought he would be arrested. So he's a prisoner in his own country. You know, he's, I think he signed his own death warrant the, the day he sent the troops in. Um, and he's trying to figure a way out of it, you know. He's already been openly challenged by uh, mutinous, the Wagner group, Prigozhin and others. There, there's a cartoon, sadly correct, showing Putin with his uh, staff guy. And he says, I very much regret the death of Prigozhin. And the other guy goes, that's tomorrow. <laughs> you know? but, but what does it say about Putin's strength that some guy who is his former chef can organize a group of mercenaries who can challenge his control of the Russian military. So I think he's, he's painting himself into a corner and he has increasingly limited options. Ironically, there's one thing that will let him out of it. You know what that is, right? The American election. Because Putin now knows if he fights through to the election and Trump gets elected, uh, Ukraine aid will evaporate, and he'll have um, be able to cut a better deal. So uh, it's all the more important that this not be left to be hostage of the U.S. political process and um, you know the kind of insanity that is is controlling it right now. Please. How optimistic are you that we will see another Kantian moment in, in some period that's not too distant from now? Um, well, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. How can I not be, you know? I mean, <laughs> my life is a, a set of improbable circumstances that have turned out to give me a very happy life. And, you know, I mean, I, I said to my wife at one point, I, I, t I say this to the students, I, when I was planning my life, professional life, I plan for all the disastrous things that could happen. What I didn't expect was that things would go better than I thought. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you told me that I would be a professor at Yale or that I would be uh, held any of these government jobs or be dean of my law school, I'd say, I, you know, if I could do one of those things, I'd be like stunned um, or get, get this medal. <laughs> but um, so, you know, um, I happen to think that uh, uh, I happen to have a, a sunny view of the world. Now, I think that to answer Marin's question, this neo-Kantian moment has to be one of public-private collaboration. Unfortunately, and for, or fortunately, um, governments are a lot weaker, and private sources of resources are much stronger. You know, what's, what saved Ukraine is... Um, My is um, Microsoft uh, led their cyber defense. You know, Elon Musk, for all of his funkiness, uh, gave them um, cyber access, and so they never lost uh, control or contact in uh, cyberspace. You know, the, the cell phone companies gave them unlimited roaming. So even when the Ukrainian government was scattered in subway stations across Kyiv and Lviv, they were still communicating. Um, so I think, you know, if you look at the response to COVID, it's been largely public-private. I, I think we need a similar moment now with regard to climate change. You know, when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, uh, all these other people stepped forward and said, um, the climate change issue is much bigger than the U.S. federal government, you know, state of California, New York. And... Um, I think we have a similar challenge, obviously, now with regard to artificial intelligence. Um, think about this, you know, Tesla, self-driving car engineers, um, uh, they have already um, uh, weighted lives of human beings inside Tesla's higher than human lives on the street, which is that if the car has to make a decision to either kill the people in the car or kill the people out of the car, it will kill the people out of the car. 
Now, that's a moral decision of the pr profoundest uh, nature, which is being made by AI engineers. Right. And, um, you know, you saw the Avengers, you know, we don't trade lives. Guess what? Uh, we trade lives all the time. You know, that's what Oppenheimer is about, that Harry Truman traded the lives of uh, millions of people in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, innocent civilians, for what he thought were American lives. So these decisions have to be made by human beings exercising moral judgment, uh, not by terminators or you know uh, autonomous uh, weapons. And um, that's how we have to think about this going forward. You know, um, or you know, Chat GPT. You know, ChatGPT passed the New York bar exam <laughs> on the second try. It passed torts and contracts the first try and then procedure the second try. <laughs> but, but what does that tell you now, you know? I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, it, this stuff is, is quickly beyond our control and capacity. And um, we haven't yet put into place a set of systems to think about the moral issues that are involved. So I, I do believe, uh, Marin, that, that um, there's going to have to be some sort of, um, um, there, there, in moments of genuine crisis, there are moments of collective reckoning that can be convened by governments if the governments are smart enough to do so. So think about this, you know, Donald Trump pulled us out of the World Health Organization in the middle of the biggest pandemic in world history. Can you imagine a more stupid thing to do? I mean, you know, a global pandemic will not be solved by any country alone. And the one mechanism that exists for global cooperation on this is the World Health Organization. And people just sort of sat there, so what? You know, or, you know, let's leave the Paris Climate Agreement at a time when, you know, oceans are um, being uh, inundated with, uh, uh, you know, rising sea level. We are now past the point where any nation or any corporation has the ability to solve these problems. There has to be uh, moments of global reckoning. Fortunately, we have the tools now uh, because of global communications that make this kind of convening possible. You know, it is possible now to talk about a gro global rule of law because um, students can communicate with students around the world. You know, when I went to uh, Ukraine, um, in 2020, it was, it was just literally a week before the pandemic hit. They invited me because I had argued for them at the International Court of Justice, and I judged their Jessup Moot Court team. And um, uh, when I went there, the, the, uh, the, the Ukrainian kids argued the exact same case in English under the exact same rules of international law that the Yale kids had argued in front of me a week earlier. The same case. And it was the 25th anniversary of the uh, Ukrainian independence out of the Ukrainian Jessup Moot Court. And all the past winners were there all 25 years. And I went up to them and I said, what are you doing? They said, we're suing the Russians. Every one of them, they're suing the Russians. And, the International Court of Justice, in the Permanent Court of Arbitration, in the uh, arbitration forums, in the World Trade Organization. Some of them were assisting the Prosecutor General's office, and they said, you know, um, and when, when I got up to argue the case, I said, Putin's short game is force. The world's long game is law. And that, that means every lawyer has to participate. Thank you very much, Professor. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> you. Thank you.